Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We start the chapter on respiration. Uh, this is O-level biology. And we are doing 5090 syllabus code. And this is the this is the chapter 8th. This is chapter 8 which is on respiration and we are going to be discussing this. Now the first thing that we look at is the syllabus. And that is the routine that we follow. That we look at the syllabus first as we start the chapter and then we look at the syllabus at the end of it. Uh, we look at the defines. There are two defines. Define, define. Then another define here. And then we have a few investigates. So whenever it's an investigate, you know, we've got to know the practical procedures. So investigate. And then we have another investigate here. Know the percentage of gases in the atmosphere and investigate. So practical procedures is when we look at the any investigate in the uh, syllabus. So oh, we look at the syllabus, we read through the syllabus and then we start uh, going through the book or you go through the video and then you make your own notes and you come back to the syllabus at the end of the chapter. Now basically we're going to be talking about an organelle which is called a mitochondria and we often say it is the powerhouse of the cell. And you see it's got uh, a very interesting structure. It's got an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and then the inner membrane is thrown into folds, which of course increases the surface area because we have a lot of protein channels which are attached to it here. And this surface area is increased so that we can have all these attached to it. So outer membrane, inner membrane, we say generates ATP. Please do not say, um, produce energy. Produce energy is a wrong word. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So energy cannot be produced. But what we say is that uh, glucose, glucose is respired. So the process of respiration takes place. So the glucose is respired. And important thing is energy is released. So please do not say energy is produced. That is very wrong. You cannot say produce energy. Produce energy is a big mistake and you write that very often because uh, we, read, we see it in our exam reports. So produce energy is wrong. And what does it uh, release the energy from? From sugars, fats, and of course proteins at times, but we don't use. And if it's in the presence of oxygen, then it will be called aerobic respiration. And if it is uh, without oxygen, then it will be called anaerobic respiration. So the mitochondria is the organelle which is responsible for the generating the energy. And basically what has to happen is that the glucose has to be converted into an ATP molecule. And this ATP is adenosine triphosphate. And this is the universal energy currency. So your cells can only use ATP. Your cells cannot use glucose, but they have the process of respiration is going to convert it into ATP. And then, of course, the cell is going to use ATP and is going to carry about processes which need ATP. You can see that the mitochondria is being enlarged here and it's been taken from this cell. And uh, there can be many mitochondria in one cell. And basically, you've got to understand is that uh, nearly every cell of our body has mitochondria in it. And the number of mitochondria, of course, varies. Uh, when you look at this diagram, it appears that the number would be not many. They could be maybe 10, 20, 30. But I mean, the size of this is not very appropriate. But and you have to realize is that they can be up to a thousand mitochondria in a cell. So uh, this diagram does not represent it very correctly and more the energy needed, like muscle cells have a lot of mitochondria in them. Any cell which needs more energy, like muscular contraction needs energy, active transport needs energy. So all that will result in more mitochondria present in that cell. Now this is a very interesting fact sheet is number of mitochondria per cell. Most of the somatic cells, now what are somatic cells? Somatic cells are body cells. So most of the body cells are have something like 100 to about 10,000 mitochondria per cell. 
Lymphocytes about a thousand, oocytes about a hundred thousand, and sperms a few hundred. And please understand is that the red blood cells do not contain any mitochondria. The reason is because you see, if a red blood cell had mitochondria, then the oxyhemoglobin, which it was transporting, the oxygen it was transporting, the oxygen would be used up in the process of aerobic respiration. So we don't want that to happen. But please understand, even though the red blood cell does not have mitochondria, but then there are enzymes in the cytoplasm where the process of respiration does take place. But please remember, this is a living cell. And then you need to remember, a bacteria also does not have any mitochondria. But a bacteria will respires as well. So bacteria has no mitochondria. But please remember, mitochondria respire as well. They've got their own respiratory enzymes. So bacteria are living. They're not something dead. So they will respire, they will release energy, they will have their own mechanism by which they will uh, change the glucose molecule and uh, produce ATP. You see, you can say produce ATP, but you can't say produce energy. So bacteria will respire, but it has no mitochondria. Red blood cells have their own process of respiration but they have no mitochondria. So please do not think red blood cells are dead cells. They are living. They live for three to four months and then they die. So important fact is the number of mitochondria per cell. Now, if you look at the equation for respiration, it's very simple. You see, uh, just like your car runs on petrol or on diesel, so our body also runs on the fuel, which is glucose. So glucose combines with oxygen and this would be aerobic respiration. Why? Because aerobic means it needs oxygen. So oxygen is present here and it's going to produce carbon dioxide and water and a lot of energy is going to be released. More energy will be released. And the equation for this is, and of course you need to balance this out. So this will be 6 CO2, 6 O2 and 6 H2O and 38 ATP molecules are produced. So the energy currency, ATP is the universal energy currency. Like, I mean, you use a currency in a country when you go shopping, you go, you will use Pakistani rupees. If you're in Pakistan, if you're in Dubai, you'll use dirhams. If you are in London, you'll use pounds. If you're in America, you'll use dollars. But the universal energy currency, any, any living organism, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a plant, whether it's a lizard, whether it's a frog, it has to use ATP. That is the energy currency, the universal energy currency. Now, this is a very good comparison for you to see how aerobic respiration is much more efficient. Now, you can see here 2830 kilojoules of energy is released. While in anaerobic respiration, in which we have the glucose, we have no oxygen, so there is... This oxygen is only present in aerobic respiration. In anaerobic respiration, straight glucose, we say, is broken down to, here we have ethanol and carbon dioxide and 210 kilojoules of energy. While in muscles, we have lactic acid and again, less energy released. So aerobic respiration is much more efficient because it's the glucose molecule is completely broken down. Now, this still has a little bit of energy left in it. This still has a little bit of energy left in it. So it still can be, uh, in the presence of oxygen, then oxidized and energy can be released. Now, the two equations that we need to learn for anaerobic respiration in animals is when you are doing in your muscles, when you do strenuous exercise, strenuous means pretty tough strenuous exercise, like you might do the treadmill on an incline, you the glucose is, there's no oxygen, so there's no glucose plus oxygen, there's no such thing, it's just glucose, and we have an arrow going out of it, produces lactic acid and energy is released. And the formula of lactic acid is C3H6O3, which is literally half of the glucose molecule. And still this could be, you know, used up uh, and it is used up and we'll talk about it when we talk about the anaerobic respiration and what happens to this lactic acid. This lactic acid is produced in the muscles. So when you're doing some sort of a tough exercise, well, this will be produced, then it will enter the blood 
and we carry it to the liver. And then it will be again converted to a molecule which can be oxidized in the presence of oxygen. And that oxygen which you breathe in by keeping on breathing faster and deeper even though you've stopped exercising is called the oxygen debt. Then in yeast, again we have anaerobic respiration. So the glucose is broken down or is respired to produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. And again, a little bit of energy is released. So the formula for ethanol, you've got to know C2H5OH, lactic acid C3H6O3. I mean, this is half of this. Well, this is a little different. So C2H5OH, you need to learn the chemistry of it so that you know how to do this in the MCQs. Now, a good comparison of photosynthesis and respiration, just not part of this chapter, but still I like to discuss it. So in photosynthesis, what do we have? We have carbon dioxide and we have water and combines plus light energy is converted to chemical energy. And uh, you know this is in the presence of chlorophyll and something which we never write, but it is always there is enzymes. So enzyme reactions, all these reactions are enzymatic and enzymes would be needed. So glucose is made and oxygen. Now the glucose and the oxygen now, the same glucose and the oxygen combined. So it is same glucose here and the oxygen combined to give you carbon dioxide water and uh, the energy is released. So what we need to understand is we could be using the same oxygen which is coming from here. So the photosynthesis could be using the same, the photosynthesis which is producing the oxygen produced in photosynthesis could be then used in respire, could be then used in respiration here. And this carbon dioxide which is being produced could be used for photosynthesis here. So you see respiration and photosynthesis are exactly, so if a plant is photosynthesizes, a time comes when there's less light, photosynthesis equals respiration. And that is called compensation point which happens at dusk and dawn, when there's just a little light. So, but when as the sun comes out and there's more and more light intensity, then the photosynthesis, the rate of photosynthesis increases and it is more than respiration. So please remember this, that the plants respire at all times, but during when there's bright sunlight, it's a bright sunny morning and it's uh, going to be photosynthesizing at a much faster rate than what the rate of respiration is. The rate of respiration is the nearly the same in a, in a tree or in a plant, except of course when there's intense activity like there's flowering and fruit formation, then the rate of respiration may increase. The next topic is uses of energy in the human body. So state the uses of energy in the human body. Now, when we look at the first one, it says muscle contraction. Now, when muscle contraction, they can give you anything. Like they can say peristalsis. Peristalsis is also muscle contraction. Pupil reflex, in which the pupil size decreases or increases as more or less light enters the eye. So peristalsis, or even inhaling and exhaling, because in inhaling and exhaling, what you have to understand is that the intercostal muscles contract and relax. So any of these examples are of muscle contraction and uh, they would all be considered under one heading, which is muscle contractions. Like people would say muscle contraction means if you're walking or if you're jogging, it's all muscle contraction. Then the second point which they have said is protein synthesis. Now in protein synthesis, please understand, it could be anything. It could be the production of insulin. It could be the production of uh, it could be the production of hemoglobin. It could be the production of enzymes. It's more specific. It could be the production of antibodies. So any of these require energy. So in your body, when it has to make all these proteins, it requires a lot of energy or you can say ATP. So protein synthesis, insulin, hemoglobin, enzymes, antibody, these are all different 
molecules which are protein in nature. Then the third example, third use they have said is cell division. Now you have to understand is they have separately said cell division and growth is a separate entity. So cell division can be for replacement of uh, cells like for instance red blood cells die and new red blood cells have to be formed so that would be cell division but growth is a permanent increase in mass. So growth would be if you know you've added more cells to the body that would be growth. But if they've been replaced, it won't be growth, it will be just cell division. Then active transport, active transport takes place a lot in your um, intestines, in your villi. Please do not say root hair cell because it says in the syllabus it's a human body. So active transport takes place in the kidneys, lots of active transport takes place in the villi. So you have a lot of uh, the neurons, active transport in the neurons, immense active transport. Then growth, which I've just said, increase in body mass or increase in permanent increase in body mass. Then uh, the passage of nerve impulses, the ability for me to talk or to move my arms or to write with a pen or a marker is, uh, is in, because I, the nerve impulses being carried to the muscles and then the muscles contract and relax and that's how I can write or I can talk. So the passage of nerve impulses. And the seventh one is maintenance of a constant body temperature. Because you and me at any time, whether this room is hot or cold, we are constantly at 37 degrees Celsius. Now in order to maintain anything, I could ask you to keep, uh, I could say, okay, let's take a beaker of water. Well, I could give you a beaker of water and I could say, okay, well, this has got 100 ml water in it. Please maintain this water at a temperature and I give you a thermometer. And I'd say, okay, please maintain this temperature at 37 degrees Celsius. Now, for that, you'll have to ask me, you'll say, okay, well, miss, then you need to give us a Bunsen burner. Some sort of a heater, some sort of a mechanism by which you can heat it. Because anything which has to be maintained at 37 degrees Celsius and 70% of our cells are made of water. So I'm giving you an example of a beaker filled with water. And you have to maintain it at 37. So you'd say, okay, well, miss, then give me a Bunsen burner or give me something to heat it. So what is that heater or that Bunsen burner in your body is a process of respiration which generates heat. And this energy is keeps your body temperature at 37 at all times. Whether this room is cold or hot, but your body temperature will remain at 37 at all times. And that is the important, that is one of the, that's why we say one of the uses of energy in the human body. So number one, muscle contraction. Number two, protein synthesis, insulin, hemoglobin, enzymes, antibodies. Then cell division, then active transport, then growth, then the passage of a nerve impulse and the maintenance of a constant body temperature. Next, we have to study the components of inspired and expired air. And as you can see here, oxygen is about 21%. Now, please remember you write the units in the heading. You do not write it in every column. So you have to give me the units in the heading. So oxygen is 21% and in expired is 16%. Carbon dioxide is 0 0.03 and it's about 4%. 4 then nitrogen remains the same, 79, 79, because it's no not used by the body or is consumed by the body. Oxygen, of course, is more in inspired air, less in exhaled air because it is used in aerobic respiration. Carbon dioxide is more in expired air or exhaled air because it is being produced by the process of respiration and we are exhaling it out. Now, water vapors, of course, are variable because it depends upon the weather. In June, July, it's very humid, so the water vapors will be very high, but uh, in the winters, like now in February, it won't be that, humidity won't be that high. But your exhaled air is saturated with water vapors because all the water vapors lining the alveoli are going to evaporate and you have all these water vapors being exhaled out uh, in, the, in the expired air. Now temperature naturally is variable in expired air, depends upon the temperature of the 
whether it's cold country you're living in or a hot place. But the expired air will have, the air temperature would have gone down to the same as your body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius. So this is a very nice comparison of the gases between inspired and expired air. Now the next topic is investigate and state the effect of, investigate means practically, and state the effect of physical activity on the rate and depth of breathing. Now this is a graph which we usually draw and this is a machine which is called a spirometer and that produces a tracing of the person breathing in and out. Now what I want you to look at is the uh, volume of the lungs is on the y-axis and of course we have time on the x-axis but that's not been shown. But what is you see from 3.5 it goes up to 4. And this, when, you, when you're at rest and you're sitting comfortably and you're inhaling in about 0.5 and then exhaling it out and then inhaling and then exhaling it out. Now that is called the tidal volume. But that is the name is not important, is the volume of air inhaled and exhaled at rest is about 0.5 liters. So this is what you have to understand is when you're at rest. But when you take a deep breath in, now when you take a deep breath in, so from three it goes up to six. And then you exhale out. And then it goes down to two. But please remember this part of the lungs, you can never exhale it out. You cannot squeeze the lungs out of all the air. So inhale and exhale. So when you inhale, it goes, the air in the lungs increases, the volume uh, in the lungs increases and then it decreases and then it increases and then it decreases and you take a deep breath in and a lot of air goes into the lungs and then you exhale out forcefully and it goes down up to here to about two. Now this is the total lung capacity. Now I don't want you to know the names of any of these. These, these are not in your syllabus but I want you to understand when you inhale and exhale at rest and what happens when you Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Again, this graph. Now, for instance, I mean, a person is at rest and he's breathing in and out very comfortably. And at this point, the person starts to exercise. Now, how is the graph going to change? The graph is going to change like this. Why? Because you're going to take deep breath in and out. So, number one, the rate of breathing is also going to increase. The rate will increase and the depth will increase. So rate and depth of breathing will both increase. So exercise, but why an exercise will rate and depth increase? The reason is that you know you need more oxygen per unit time. So more oxygen breathed in. That's good because you know your muscles require more oxygen because there is more aerobic respiration taking place, more energy being released. While at the same time, when you are exercising, more CO2 is being exhaled out. So more CO2 will be exhaled out because your rate and depth of breathing has increased. So more CO2 produced, more CO2 exhaled out. When you're doing physical activity, the aerobic respiration increases. So when the aerobic respiration increases, that needs more oxygen. But it's also producing more carbon dioxide. So that needs to be removed as well. And similarly, we have to correlate with the heart rate. Your heart rate increases. When your heart rate increases, your circulation increases. It becomes a faster circulation. So when it becomes a faster circulation, the oxygen absorbed in the lungs is carried to the muscles faster in unit time. And the carbon dioxide produced in the muscles is carried to the lungs quickly so that it is exhaled out. So two things happen. Number one, rate and depth of breathing increases. So rate increases, depth increases as well. And heart rate increases as well. So circulation becomes much more faster. And the oxygen needed by the muscles is provided to the muscles while the carbon dioxide produced by the muscles is taken to the lungs where it will be exhaled out. Now let's get a little familiar with the different parts of the... Uh, system which we are uh, studying, studying now. Number one, we've got the nasal cavity through which we should breathe in because it warms the air and of course it also removes all the dust particles from it. 
and then it goes out into the voice box which is called the larynx so people who are mouth breathers usually have problems because they develop throat infections why because if the nose is blocked then they're going to breathe through the mouth and that's not a very good idea and then as it goes on now into a tube which is called the windpipe but the correct name for that is trachea so we have to know it but of course some places it says windpipe and then the trachea divides into right and left bronchus and then we have the right lung and the left lung and you have this sheet here which separates the thorax from and that's called the diaphragm and then you can see the capillary network around the bronchioles end in alveoli and there is this capillary network around it and the capillaries are carrying the blood so the oxygen is going to diffuse in and the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out another very good diagram you can see the labeling here is now slightly different and is more conducive to the o levels trachea you've got the ribs and the lungs are just inside the rib cage protects the lungs and then you have the bronchus the right and the left bronchus which divides into further bronchioles and then of course we have the alveoli so trachea bronchus right and left bronchus and then bronchioles and the ribs and in between the ribs is muscles which are called intercostal muscles and there are two types of intercostal muscles internal intercostal muscles and external intercostal muscles so we'll discuss them a little later another very good diagram showing you the details the larynx uh, this is the collarbone which we've done in a previous chapter and then you can see this is the external intercostal muscles which are towards the turning inside and the internal intercostal muscles are the other way around so you need to be very careful the internal intercostal muscles are like this while the external intercostal muscles are like this pointing towards the breastbone or the sternum and this is the sternum as you can see here they've labeled the sternum which is the breastbone and then you can see this is the diaphragm and this lung is enclosed in pleural membranes then you can see the trachea the rings of cartilage which support and keep the trachea open when you bend your neck then the right lung then the right and the left bronchus so this will be the right bronchus and this would be the left bronchus and then it divides into bronchioles and you can see this section the cut section of the this is the cut of the of the rib because if you cut the ribs this is what you're going to see and in between the ribs you're going to see the intercostal muscles these are the intercostal muscles which you can see in between the ribs and the intercostal muscles again are of two types the external intercostal muscles and the internal intercostal muscles so please pause the video and have a look at this and be very clear about how you're going to label this diagram if it comes in the exams so i'm going to take a pause now and i'm going to end this video here because this will continue into the next video so there's another video which will follow on this chapter thank you very much